On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named 22. And 22 was raised by a raging, competitive, narcissistic mother. It's a story of physical abuse, shame, hypervigilance, self-forgiveness, and the healing process. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. With me today, I have 22. How are you? I'm doing well, Brandon. That rhymed. (laughs) 22, how are you? Everyone, today, it's going to be an unusual day for two unusual folks. And... The reason I say that is we have recorded before, and it did not go great. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree with that. (laughs) All right. All right. We're in agreement. And so 22 is in our support group, which you can go to at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, you press that button that says support, and away we will go from there. You'll get all the support. Lovely community. People here like 22. And, you know, I I do a lot of recordings with people and most of the recordings do not work or just don't work out for various reasons. And a lot of the time there's nothing I can really, there's nothing I can do about it. And yours was one of those cases where I didn't know where to go, how to fix it or whatever. We were bouncing from story to story to story. And when that happens, that's those are things that happen where people usually turn off the show because it's just story to story to story. There's not a lot kind of going on between it. And we, we needed to know how to fix that. And I just said, kind of leave it with me. And, when, uh, and, you know, some days I have weird epiphanies and I think of these things, different things. I'm an ideas person. So... In the process of this, 22 over here was uh, in our support group and working out her stuff. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. (laughs) All right. And I am sitting here watching it all. And sometimes, you know, I get emails (laughs) or messages that say, sorry about that. Sorry about this. Sorry I did that. Sorry I did this. And to explain what those stories are, you know, uh, within your process of what you were doing, you felt the freedom to be yourself and trusted everyone in the group that you weren't going to be judged and you're getting your voice amongst many other things. And I was like, okay, whatever's going on, these things are, she's working these things out. You know, you've made proclamations about things and you're, but you're always involved with other people and your great support to other people as well. And I think the support that we give you is that we don't get in your way of what you're doing and and we don't judge you. And it was really just, it's really, it was an honor. I think an honor for everyone in the group to watch you do what you're doing because you're you're working so hard and it's very obvious that you know when people say what is the work i would say you know what 22 is doing is the work every single day you're working on something and you know at that point that's when i realized that this is the show what you're working on you know right now that is what we're obviously we're going to tell the story of your life but you know uh, with going back and figuring out what to do one day i was sitting in the exact same seat i was sitting in right now and that's when the light bulb went off in my head and when i get an idea like you know uh, it bursts through me 
an, an idea and I get really excited and I really wanted to text you right away and be like, I got the idea. I know what we're going to do. And I think literally like 15 minutes later, uh, while I thought that you had texted me already about something. And I'm like, I got our idea. And <laughs> I was really excited because it would kind of throw the format as we are doing right now on its head and a little bit, maybe not fully on its head, but the way we're going to go about this is a little bit different. And I was really excited about that. And I was also excited that I learned something throughout this whole entire process, you know, that things don't have to be the way we're always doing things. And then if given time with certain people, we can create different types of things, which give people a break from the regular way we do things. And so I want to thank you for uh, that and, and being patient with me, um, you know, because you know me better than uh, most people who ever listen to this show or whatever. You know, a lot of people on the show might think I'm a little bit more. I, they might think I'm somewhat goofy or, or who knows what. But like anyway, I went off on a whole tangent there. This is kind of what we're doing today. And the first thing, uh, you know, we discussed was your name. And usually on the day, you know, I go, what do you want your name to be to someone? And they go, you pick it. And so I pick it, but you picked your name today and yes. your name 22 has a meaning. And so let's just start right there. Tell us why 22. Okay. So for anybody who has seen the movie soul, <laughs> 22 is the character that Tina Fey boys. Um, anyone who hasn't seen <laughs> the movie Saul, uh, 22 is um, a character that has not lived life yet. Um, I don't want to ruin the movie for anybody. Just ruin it. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, basically, there are two main characters in the movie Saul, and one thinks that he has to have purpose in order to enjoy life, I guess, to be fulfilled. He achieves a goal that he's always been striving for and then dies, <laughs> like, right away. Okay, so he gets matched up with a soul that has not lived life yet, and they kind of figure out between the two of them that uh, they can gain from each other. She supposedly can not live life so 22 is afraid to live life and it doesn't appreciate uh what life has to offer like uh you know the sun shining and, and things like that but you're a little bit different from that you've taken something complete not completely different but a little bit different from how it goes in the movie with 22, but you still resonate with her. I equate her fear of life to my fear of change. So the way my life is right now as an adult, it, it, I love my life and it's beautiful and stuff, but you know, um, there's the whole surviving and not thriving factor maybe. And uh, now that I kind of feel that like I found something that is my own, which I'm sure we're going to get get into later in more depth, um, I realized that change is going to have to happen. And um, so that was kind of something that I related to 22 on, where her fear of life, to me, it, you know, it equated with my fear of change. So. so, you know, we started kind of there in our conversation, and... I guess the idea that I had was, well, let's start from the end of what you're, what you're working on and, and let's use that to work our way back to the beginning. So we came up with themes of, uh, of the episode that people might resonate with. So everyone, we're going to go through a bunch of different themes, but first we're going to start off where we usually do with the family story, 22 Tell us about your mom. So I guess, you know, my mom grew up with uh, a father who I now, after some thinking, I believe 
was a narcissist himself. Um, he was abusive to physically abusive to my two uncles, which would be her brothers. Uh, she told me a story of uh, him dragging one of the uncles down a hall past her bedroom and then beating him with a log that would be meant for a fireplace. Um, I don't know if she experienced any physical abuse. I, you know, I have no idea. She never really talked about anything. But my uncles, when they talk about her, like, it, like it's almost like a joke. Like, they'll, they'll be like, so where's your angry mom? You know, and, and they always, all of the stories that they have about her are her just completely raging out of control um, that, you know, she did whatever she wants. She'd sneak out windows. And then if she got caught, she'd slip out, that type of thing. So, And your mom is an angry mom and your mom is a competitive mom. Uh, oh, yeah. And your mom is, wants all the attention, you know, to be on her. Absolutely. So, you know, the mood of your house would be you really really you know obviously you're tiptoeing around uh her the whole time if there was like a color or a scene of how you felt about your house what would it be dark gray dark gray <laughs> yeah it, it, that's like every memory i have from any of the houses that i lived in with my mom and family it's just there's like a dark you know cast overcast to it so so you know one of the things that is noticeable that you have been working on uh and we're gonna hear stories of, of your childhood about it like how these things formed uh it, it was or is finding who you are discovering your voice so you know take us through you know your childhood in the sense of how your voice was taken away i think i was Probably, I don't know, maybe around eight-ish. Across the street from us, there lived a young Laotian couple that had three children. And there was a, a teenage boy and then two young girls that were, um, one girl was my age and then there was one that was like a year younger. And um, they were wonderful people to me. So like my mom... And uh, stepdad weren't feeding us, you know, like hardly at all. All of us were very underweight. Um, we weren't getting any attention. Uh, and I had, you know, befriended the eldest daughter. Or, you know, she's not the eldest, but the elder daughter. And I basically was lived over at their house. And uh, the family, uh, it just they were just so lively and... Um, it was comfortable over there. They invited me over for dinner and fed me. They were just wonderful people. And I basically deified anybody who was kind. I didn't understand that that was what people are like. Like, I thought my situation was normal and that these were just extraordinary people. You know, like, I didn't understand that my situation was the abnormal one. <laughs> But um, so it, one thing that bothered me is that my stepdad would say, you know, derogatory things like, um, I bet the government gave them money to buy a house here in our country and this and that. And um, I just didn't understand that of what he was saying at that young age. But it, I struggled with it in my mind because I, you know, it's, you believe your parents when they speak. But it just didn't match up with what I was seeing. So I'm seeing these wonderful people who are nothing but kind and their house is happy and lively and they're feeding me and doing kind things. And then my house, where this person is that's saying these awful things, is dark and scary and cold. So that was kind of the beginning of me, the very first memory that I have of me having feelings that are thoughts and feelings that are different than what my parents were conveying to people. So here's a moment where your stepdad and 
obviously your mom is is grouped in with him is is telling you certain things about other people and you're seeing it from a completely different perspective and you know you as you told me before uh, come from a family that has uh, family uh, meetings and sometimes these family meetings uh, you speak up in these things and you think it's going well for you but then it doesn't happen I spoke up and I was the only one who did everybody else sat there silent and that, that's kind of how I am anyway I always will and um, you know everybody acted normal throughout the rest of the meeting but as soon as it was as it was over and my mom could get me alone she pulled me aside in the hallway where nobody could see and then wasn't very kind to me and uh you know told me asked me why why would you speak up like that you know you sound like an idiot um you know you sound very immature and then she was saying something about me wearing makeup like my (laughs) stepsister which was weird because I was eight but yeah, so. And, you know, within the group, you know, you're, you're discovering your voice and saying things certain times. And I think sometimes you're expecting uh, a bad reaction, which is then when I get like a sorry email. Yeah. And, and my favorite one was actually it wasn't typed out. It was in the group. You blurted out, not the Enneagram is stupid, but (laughs) something around those lines or like, I don't believe that like, I like something like I have free will, like something along those lines. It was, what what would you, what did you say? I I don't remember exactly what I said, but um, I could tell you what I was thinking, at least at the time. It was in the support group, and you had just brought up that one of the um, survivors that told their story, that I actually loved her story more than probably above any of the other ones, was a big anagram person. And I just was like, well, that's nice. I'm not. And then, you know, I went into why, uh, which I do you want me to go into that? <laughs> uh, no, I just, for me, it was just like, uh, it was it was like an out of the blue kind of thing, and that's when I was like, "Yeah, whatever." And I think like the next, like I think you immediately feel bad right when you do it, because that's how you were, you know, you grew up without having a voice. So now here you voiced your actual opinion, and then your reaction right away was to apologize. Yes, and I think I got either got like a. A DM the next day or, or maybe right after or an email apologize. I'm like, don't apologize. Like no apology needed. That's you, you know, that's your belief. It's your thing. And, uh, I'm, I'm not offended. I didn't create the, any, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like I took no offense and I was happy that you did it. It made me really happy that you were just comfortable, comfortable enough to do something like that because it's a process of getting your voice back and, and being amongst people that you trust to say those things. And, you know, that's how you be kind of became part of my own learning process of what was going on through your own process, which is to me really uh, part of the cool thing about everything, which is why I wanted to redo all of this again, you know? So, and just to tell everyone, you know, we're going through all these themes today that will be kind of going over stories. There are a lot of stories in your life that really, we won't be discussing and some of those stories are truly terrible, terrible stories because these are some of the things that we were discussing in the our, our, the first time we talked. So let's just tell one story, I guess, right here. And I know this should probably go into the shame section, but we're already here with the segue. So, so another thing that your mom did... Um, as far as shame is concerned, and it's a really despicable thing that, that she did uh, to you was uh, something we really never heard on the show. And, and someone out there might experience this uh, is bathroom abuse. So kind of take us through what happened. Okay. So the first time was when I was very, very young. And honestly, I think that 
um, it was more of a neglect thing to start, but I think she learned that I feel shame from it and then brought it forward later. But um, uh, when I was very young, we had a den that was, it was a renovated attached garage. Um, So it was actually quite nice. It was a beautiful room, but uh, it was right off of the kitchen. And my mom, I was very young, like four years old, would put me in the den and then close the door and just hang out on the phone with her girlfriends in the kitchen. And uh, there was one particular time where I had to use the bathroom. Um, I had to go to number two. And uh, I went and opened the door and, right, you know, my mom's doing the, you know, go back in their motion, you know, into the den motion with her hands while she's talking on the phone. So I go back and um, this happens a few times until like it becomes like I have to go. And uh, so do my last attempt and, you know, she's giving me the nasty whisper scream and I go back into the den and then I had to find a boss and I defecated in the boss. And uh, then later my mom found it. I don't know how long. I don't remember that part of it. It's kind of funny to me, but I tried to pin it on the cat. And But my mom knew. I mean, she didn't. I don't rem- ha- remember her flipping out or anything. But there there was still uh, an attempt to make me feel shame, a successful attempt, by, you know, well, why didn't you tell me, you know, that you, that this is disgusting, that type of a thing. And here, like, like, like in a strange way, you know, she, this all happened because of her, and then she kind of played stupid about it. Yes, exactly. And uh, so, you know, there was a little bit of gaslighting, and you know, with shame. Um, but I knew, you know, even at four, I was like, I did tell you, and you know, I told you, bitch. But you know, whatever. Um, but I think that situation kind of carried forward and it didn't happen often, but it did happen a few more times where later, um, even, you know, when we had other houses, our houses never had more than one bathroom. So my mom would lock herself in the bathroom knowing when I had to go and I would be outside of the door pleading, you know, I have to go, I have to go. I, you know, it's coming to the point where I don't have a choice anymore. And, uh, and she just wouldn't answer. I mean, I would hear nothing whatsoever. And, uh, so I didn't know what to do. I mean, I wasn't going to go out in the yard and like a dog and take a shit in the yard. Um, I didn't know where to go. Uh, looking back now, I'm like, hmm, I wonder why I didn't think about the trash can, but, uh, I pooped in my hand and I would stand there and hold it. <laughs> outside of the bathroom door and my mom would finally open the door and I would walk past her, throw it in the toilet, wash my hands. And then she would just be like, I can't even look at you. You're disgusting. I can't believe this, you know? And, um, I felt a lot of shame about that then, but now when I look back, I feel that little girl saying, but you made me do it. You made me do that. You know? So now, you know, I'm, finally passed that shame um that yeah, that that has to take a giant toll on your self-worth as a very young child oh, um yeah. kind of going forward you know when it comes to other things that your mom did to erode your self-worth um i get do you have any other like um situations where your mom maybe gaslit you at the same time, like, and also eroded your self worth. Well, okay, so or, or like, like, or chipped away at your, you know, uh, so you start kind of maybe doubting yourself too. Yeah, so th- those stories are more in my adulthood um, because I think a lot, a lot of my memories around childhood revolve around the actual physical abuse, mm-hmm. you know, but the the gaslighting stuff that you're talking about. Um, that happened in adulthood and there was, there was like, I have this one memory for sure that was just so weird where, um, we were all hanging around, um, 
at, I think it was Christmas or something like that. So we're all sitting there and I know that my parents, they like to watch, um, you know, like religiously inspirational movies and stuff like that. And I had heard about something on This American Life, that podcast, that they had made a movie um, it was, and it was on Netflix. So I brought it up, you know, like, I'm like, hey, you guys would probably like this. And it was just the weirdest thing. They just sat there staring at me. Like everybody in the family sat there stone faced staring at me. And I'm like, do I have a booger hanging out of my nose? Like what, what's going on? Why is everybody looking at me? And like, there's just no reaction whatsoever. So storytelling, you know what I mean? I'm starting to go through in my head thinking, I must have, I'm something, I must have done something wrong, you know? So yeah, that, the, that self-worth and gaslighting stuff, like was just, it was just so weird because I always felt like I was doing something wrong. Always, you know, even when I was trying to bring up something that I thought they would enjoy, you know? And that's in a weird way that starts gaslighting your, you start gaslighting yourself. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you brought up physical abuse there. How often, you know, did you, we won't go into a lot of details of, of any sort of stories, but uh, how often did you have to endure like a physical abuse? So it, it wasn't like daily, but the fear of it was daily, but it was a lot. And um, like, you know, the stories that I wrote out that you've read, and some of them, which I've talked about today, um, those are probably the biggest ones, but I was slapped you know, smacked, pushed around, thrown, you know, downstairs, you know, uh, whipped around by my hair, you know, just a, a, a lot. So like, quote unquote, smaller abuses, but they were all horrible, happened pretty often, you know, and, like I would say multiple times a week. And, and, you know, that what your mom's rage with all these things became uh, a giant thing and we'll eventually talk about, you know, because of the physical abuse, because of the raging that would go on and, and we'll eventually get into it, how, uh, you, you know, we're going to discuss eventually insinuation, uh, reading the room and moods like that. Um, so let's get back to shame a little bit and how, you know, caretaking became a big part of your life, caretaking other people's feelings. Shame gets involved here as well. So, uh, you know, take us down this road. Okay. Um, well, when I, uh, the, when I was very, very young, um, we lived in a, very, a small town and that was before my mom met my stepdad and it was with my biological father. Uh, I have two brothers. I have um, one that was born three years after me. And then another one that was born two years after him. When that younger one was born, um, our house didn't have enough bedrooms on the upper level for us kids to all have our own room. So um, my parents put me in the basement and <laughs> to set the scene, this is not a finished basement. This is completely unfinished. It's dark. It's dank. It's all cement. There was a room, but the room only had like a built-in cabinet in there. Um, and then they did have like an area rug with, you know, my bed on top of it, but that's it that was where they put me and I just felt like, like really deep sense of shame for being put down there. Like I really felt like there was something wrong with me and like, I was a bad girl. Uh, why are they singling me out and putting me down here? Um, uh, was down there one day, uh, when my mom put me down for whatever reason and she wouldn't let me out of the room. It was daytime. You know, there wasn't any reason for me to have to be down there. Um, I had a book of Grimm's fairy tales on the, uh, the cabinet counter. And I, um, there was also a perfume bottle that was shaped like Disney Cinderella on there. And it was glass. I don't know why, but in the seventies, they made some really weird stuff for kids, <laughs> glass perfume bottle, 
probably not a good idea. But anyway, I uh, was trying to, I was very young. I was probably like four, maybe five. And I, um, no, I was, I, I was probably five, but I was learning to read. So I wasn't completely, you know, <laughs> Uh, fluent in reading yet but um i came across a word that i couldn't figure out how to pronounce and uh after trying you know very hard to go through the phonetics that i was taught in my school um i still couldn't work it out so i got mad and i picked up the glass perfume bottle and threw it on the floor which was cement so it shattered um and then when i went to try to leave the room i ended up walking on some shards of glass and got bloody um and then when my parents found me crying and full of blood on my feet, they yelled at me for having anger issues. Uh, so that's one of the big things um, that I feel shame about is if I show any feelings. Um, if I have emotions, then automatically I just feel deep shame. Um, I Actually, I don't really have that as much anymore but that was something that i i've been working on so uh shame is a big thing but has been a huge struggle for me and how did that show up i guess later on in life when it came to um uh, bottling up your emotions so yeah that's exactly like that's a good point to bring up because the person that i am and we all know those people I'm that person. I don't show emotions. You know, I'll hold everything in. I'll let let things slide with people. They can walk all over me dun, 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 until that one day when I've had too much. And then I explode. And when I explode, I explode huge. And I scare the ish out of everybody. And everybody wants to go running. And then, you know, then they're like, what the hell is wrong with her? You know, or at least that's how I feel about what they're thinking. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, learning how to have a healthy way (laughs) of feeling my emotions and allowing them to happen was very important in my healing process instead of holding them in. So anger obviously came out terrible. And when it came out terrible at that point, did you just want to hide yourself again and be like, I don't like, I don't even know how to do this at all. Like in the sense of, uh, I don't want to, in a sense you're caretaking because you don't want to put anyone else through the experience of being on the receiving end of a thing you do not know how to express properly. Is that correct? That is exactly correct. I would, it it turned into a a shame cycle for me or a spiral. Like I would like, and if I blew up, I would blow up and then retreat and then berate myself because I knew I hurt people and by, you know, either kind of being scary with my voice or maybe I slammed a door or I stomped around or something like that. Um, And so then I would berate myself and then I would feel worse about myself and then I would blow up again eventually. So it, yeah, it just isn't a good spiral. It's, it's healthier to deal with your emotions and when you, were, when you were doing your research on narcissism, abuse, narcissistic rage, were you like, is that narcissistic rage or is that me trying to figure things out? Because there's a giant difference between what you were doing and narcissistic rage. I mean, you had the thoughts of other people and their <laughs> and caretaking them in your, in your mind here. Yeah. So I understand that now, but yeah, that was like when I first, um, kind of went into crisis, so to speak, uh, after realizing that I had all this trauma, that was, that was a tough thing to get through. Was I thought like all of these traits that I would hear about narcissists having, I would be like, oh, well, I do that. I'm a narcissist, you know, and rage was, was definitely one of them. 
But yes, now I see that it, it's like the rage is coming from a different place with a narcissist than with a codependent. <laughs> so, um, but yes, that was, that was really tough to get through. I, I was definitely one of the, am I a narcissist type? So a big thing within your family, as mentioned earlier, that your mom is a competitive person. And, you know, obviously your mom, uh, as we explained earlier, has has rage issues as well. And things are really like a competition. So for you, a lot of things were taken away from you. Yeah. So uh, take us through, you know, when it came to your mom uh, and, and you, what was taken away from you and, and why were those things taken away? Basically, you know, without like sounding like I'm feeling sorry for myself, I feel like everything was, you know, uh, um, now I realize that I actually have it all, you know, within myself. But um, back then it was like, not we weren't allowed anything. We weren't allowed to have any individuality whatsoever. Uh, when I was a teenager, if I tried to decorate my room, my mom would flip out and pull everything off the walls. And she'd be like, and when I say screaming, I'm saying like, horror movie lead actress screaming, you know, like she's being chased by Jason or something. Um, So it's like, you know, Banshee screaming, but yeah, so that she did that to me. And, you know, there's a time when my brother in adulthood, he disappeared. We were all worried that he was going to take his life. And my mom's reaction is to walk through his house and take, all his knickknacks and decorations and she's shaking her head the whole time. And I just, I remember like I was raging inside because I was like, this, this is what you're focusing on right now. When my brother, you know, may be dead. I don't know. Uh, and this is all you can think of is whatever is going on in her mind about him having decorations in his house. Um, I didn't understand at the time. Now I understand that, like, it bothered her that he had his own, you know, individual likes and dislikes, and that isn't okay with her. But, yeah, so individuality is a huge thing that we all lost. Um, All all of us siblings, you know, it was all about her. Uh, We couldn't, we weren't comfortable pursuing anything because... She would, she always had all these grand stories about how wonderful she was at everything, like, you know, painting, and she was a musician, and she was a singer, and she was a model, and a writer, and all these things, and she would tell us these grand stories. Sorry, in my mind, when you, you know, are, are because people can't see how your body language is while you're telling this. And, you know, in my mind, your your mom is like this or the feeling that she wants to be is this Marilyn Monroe, uh, Jane Mansfield type with the dress on and like, oh the, my God, like yes. the di- like the really big necklace. Um, and like, there's, in my mind, there's like a piano player and like a grand piano and like, she might be doing songs. She has a cigarette. She's telling stories into a microphone. That's the person in my mind that, you know, based on your body language and and how you're describing her, that she wants to be. So I, yeah, you're right on, except for the smoking, because that would be, you know, very unchristian to do, but (laughs) But yes, like, oh, I loved that you said the gown because that was one of the things I remember talking with my therapist with is that not when, just the gown, but like yeah. the gloves that oh, go everything. that go to yeah. like the elbow, those types of things. Yes. <laughs> I totally I could see it in my mind. But she actually did kind of do that in real life once. And, and like when we lived in that small town. I mean, it was so small. It was like under 1,500 residents. So we were out there. We were isolated. We weren't going to see anybody over the holidays except for our immediate family. And my mom would put this like gown on 
And with her cleavage, just like the thing like went down to her belly. Her cleavage is everywhere. She puts on all her makeup. She irons her hair. And she was a beautiful woman, you know, mind you. But but it was just so weird. It's like, what are you doing this for? Nobody's going to see you. And then, you know, my stepdad, or if it was like way back when, my biological father would have to take photos of her. And like, it was just so weird. And then she later did it with her own uh, brother. You know, he would come over and she'd sit on top of the hood of his truck and she'd like boobs out, like with her back arched and she's posing and her brother is taking pictures of her. It, it's just very strange. But yes, she definitely was the, like, I think in her mind, she was that great actress. Like you're. And, and you kids are her captive audience that, can, oh, yeah. that cannot go anywhere. Yep, exactly. We would line up on the couch and she would prance around, like literally prance around in front of us. And I mean, yeah, it's just very strange. And she would dance and very rarely were we allowed to get up and dance with her, but it was more about putting on a show for us. And she wouldn't do this when... Well, when when you say put on a show for us, she was... Technically, she was putting on a show for herself, well, yeah. You guys were just the people she needed to be there to applaud her and think that she's great. That's true. But we did because it's our mother and we were young. So in our minds, she was the goddess that that she wanted us to think she was because kids do think their parents are, you know, these amazing people. And especially if their parents are telling them that. You know, and she was beautiful and blah, blah, blah. We didn't know better. So we thought she could dance well. I don't know. (laughs) So when it came to your own abilities, because obviously she has these things that she wanted to be and everything. So when it came to your own abilities within this time frame, what were the things that you loved most that were then taken away from you or you were one upped? or told that she's better or something along those lines? Writing was the big thing. I, um, I did like to write. It came easy to me. And um, I won a writing contest within the church system that I went to. And it was like a state level contest. It was kind of a, you know, a big deal within the church. And uh, they had uh, an award ceremony. I was invited to it. I was already told that I had won first prize. And um, I, I told my mom, and it was just completely, you know, like like it was nothing. She just answered me saying, you know, I'm too tired from daycare. She provided daycare um, for people during the week. And that was it. That was the end of that. And uh, somebody within the church had attended the ceremony and accepted the trophy on my behalf and uh, brought it to me. Um, and I carried that thing around with me like three years until I lost it, you know, at, at, during one of our moves. But yeah, it really meant a lot to me, even as an adult, because I always had that reminder of like, I, I can do this. It, it reminded that you can do it, but is there a certain point when, you know, I guess the influence of your mom takes that power away from you and you eventually shy away from from kind of doing it like shame has been placed upon it in some sort of way you know here's something that you're good at your mom doesn't like that someone is good at something because she wants to be the one that's always good at something so all of a sudden you're not allowed to celebrate this And, you know, so your accomplishments sound like they get cut down. So when things are a big deal to you, I guess pride in in who you are or things that you do, um, does this kind of hark back to, like, you're not allowed to have emotions about that? Like all these things that we've already talked about, shame and all those things, you know, what is like a sense of, um, you're, I guess I'm, I'm rambling here, but um, 
was self pride or self love stolen from you? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I probably should have went into that more and I'm sorry for that. But yes, a- along with all of those things that my mom told us that she was great at, um, we were never allowed to pursue any of those things, which was basically everything. Uh, um, and if we did and we started to feel a sense of pride, we would be shot down by her um, sometimes even our stepdad, but uh, it was usually her. And so it like kind of cultivated a feeling of shame around having any feelings of pride. And then in addition to that, the competition factor, uh, uh, there was, she, she always had an attitude of like, how dare you, you know, how dare, like if I brought even in my adult life, if I just even talked about a promotion at work, it would be, she would come back with like, oh, she worked at this one job in the downtown zone when she was, you know, in her twenties or something. And it was, it was really weird and childish, you know, it was like, oh, that's cool, mom. I'm glad you did that. And then it, that was it. Then I wouldn't be able to talk about the fact that I got a promotion anymore. Um, and so then for me, I've always, until recently, had, you know, guilt and shame attached to any feelings of self-worth even or pride. Like, that <laughs> it would make me feel like I was a narcissist, you know? Like, who the hell do I think I am, you know, for being proud of something that I did or for even pursuing something? Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and say I hear this out of other survivors in the group sometimes. And it's, and it's hard to hear. It's hard to hear other people say things like that um, because I recognize it now. <laughs> I've kind of worked through it. And, and it's just, yeah, it's just so sad, you know, that these narcissists take that away from us. Um, but, yeah, like all of us siblings, it's like that. None of us um, pursue anything. And one thing that I find interesting is that you're not really allowed to go any farther than the narcissist did. So, it was rough for us because my mom didn't do shit. So like we basically, I mean, we all have done more than her anyway, but even that is not a lot. So that was hard. You know, it, I can totally see the, where your ceiling is dictated by how far the narcissist has gone. So yeah, that's, you know, so all these things are happening within your household uh, and obviously into uh you know your your adulthood the one thing that we haven't really discussed yet and I'm going off script here a little is you know the relationship between you and your siblings um you know during this time so are you guys strangers to each other are you guys teammates how do you people interact do you all recognize it, what's going on and what's everyone's role? Okay, so now where I am right now is I don't see anybody in my family. Um, but I'm going to say, you know tell you how we were before that. I thought that we were all tight. We all we saw each other a lot. Um, I thought it was because we had this great family. You know, um, and it, it's at least with my siblings, you know, even after I kind of started to pick up that there was something wrong with my mom, I thought, well, at least I have my siblings. But then things started to become apparent to me that there was like a chess game kind of being played. I don't know if that's a good way to explain it, but um, with this competition factor, that my mom has with each of us, she also tries to put us in competition with each other and she succeeds. Um, So there'll be an aspect of competition with her where if she calls me, we'll be speaking on the phone and she'll compete with me by talking about how much time she spent with my siblings. And then if I tried to, 
you know, if I not even try to say like, I'm not doing this in competition, but if I'm like, Oh, that's great. Yeah. I saw him the other day too, you know, just innocently, then you can hear her trying to one up me and, um, frantically almost, you know, saying, Oh, well I did this too. And blah, blah, blah. So that's one aspect of the competition factor with my mom. And the other aspect with the siblings is that then she would arrange like dinners with some of the siblings, but not other of the siblings, but we would all know that this is going on and it would it would be like, okay, so I have four siblings. Two of the siblings would be invited to dinner all the time. Two of us were never invited to dinner. And then one time, you know, one of my siblings that did go invited me, not understanding that there was a, you know, competition power play going on here, um, just innocently invited me along. And then I show up and in doing so, I'm hurting the other sibling. Um, so like it would start to cause us to, I guess like I never, I don't feel like I fell into it as much, but it would cause the siblings to do things to try to make my mom happy so that they would be invited to these dinners. Um, and, did and, this, and did this happen also when you were younger that you guys were in competition to make your mom happy? So that I don't know. Okay. I am, the, I'm the eldest and I bailed when I was uh, okay. 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 So maybe that happened. Like, honestly, maybe someday we'll be speaking to one of my siblings on the show. I don't know, but, um, they, they probably have a whole different experience after I moved out of the house. Okay. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the thing that the, oh, the feeling of our family that went on it creates some bitterness. I know we all love each other and I, I really do, even though I don't see them anymore. Um, but, um, and you don't see them because it just wasn't healthy due to the dynamics and, um, you know, not that people were, were any of your, uh, siblings become like your mom or no? That, that's a question. Like, it's hard for me. I don't want to, like, you know, diagnose anyone, but I do have one sibling. I'm not even going to say what sex they are, um, but is very entitled okay. and will put themselves on everybody without asking and expect things and will pull it the fuck out if they don't get it. Um, and then. I have another sibling who became the surrogate mother after I moved out that um, has the same who the hell do you think you are attitude that my mom and stepdad do. So, like, you also can't bring up any achievements around that sibling. So there are traits, but I think I have traits, too, that if you were to interview them, they would be like, well, you know. Sometimes 22 would throw something. Think, uh, you know, <laughs> speaking of throwing stuff. Yes. You know, one of the things that's like an offshoot for you throughout this whole entire process is you've become reactive to things. Yes. You read into things when maybe yeah. reading into things shouldn't be there. You insinuate things you do some storytelling to yourself and this is an interesting you know thing of you know why someone can become reactive why they read into things why is there insinuation and why is there storytelling and we discussed this for a bit and you know when you grow up and you're in a situation where you're trying to read the room all the time and you're trying to understand the mood the other person is in, you become hyper vigilant to being aware 
of someone else's mood. So, uh, mood. so you're, you're, going to, you're going to start insinuating. You're going to start storytelling. You're going to be reactive and read into things. And these things are going to hurt you down the line. Mm-hmm. But at this time of your life, these are vital survival skills and because everything that you're going to be insinuating et cetera et cetera you're thinking the worst but that's going to save you and then when the worst maybe not might not happen you'll be like ah oh. <laughs> you know later on in life you're thinking the worst but that person's not your mom so there's and now you're making up these crazy things in your head mhm and it gets you nowhere. It's exhausting, you know. So, you know, you know these things are are happening to you. Is like, is there a specific instance within you know growing up where like there's just a great story that kind of shows everything that we just I just kind of said there. Okay, so there are many, but um, what's your favorite? Oh. One of the biggest ones. Uh, first of all, before what's your I go, favorites? What's your favorite traumatic yeah, story? Yeah, my favorite? I got that shit beat out of me. Sorry. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sorry for everyone who thinks I'm very insensitive, but today no. um, we're trying to have a good time talking about terrible things. Yeah, and I have a dark sense of humor, so I'm okay with laughing at trauma. But anyway, I won't laugh at other people's trauma, though. But... Uh, First, I have to say... You're such an Enneagram 9. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, how do I verbally flippy the bird? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so, uh, my mom, like, her MO was to... Like, no matter what you... You weren't safe. So you were always trying to find the safe thing to do, but it doesn't, it didn't matter. Like you were damned if you do, damned if you don't, literally. And um, so I just want to say that beforehand so people understand there was never anything I could do to make myself safe, but I was always trying to find something to make myself safe. Um, but the story that I'm going to talk about is when I was, uh, very young. Again, we're going back to, um, when I was about eight years old and I, uh, my parents, they would leave me. I was the eldest daughter and they would leave me with my two brothers. My sister wasn't born yet alone while they went and ran errands and went out or did whatever it is that they did. They would close all the, the blinds and, lock the door. They would tell me not to answer the phone, not to open the window coverings, not to answer the door. Um, Of course, me being young, I thought that this was out of protection for us kids. I understood it as that they were trying to make us safe and protect us from predators. Um, And they would be gone for hours. So one of the times they returned back And my mom started accusing me of inviting the teenage boy from across the street over. Well, I was eight years old, so obviously I didn't invite the teenage boy over. Um, He and I really didn't have anything to do with each other other than I was friends with his sister. Uh, And I, you know, tried to convince my mom that. And when trying to convince my mom would entail me, like, begging and pleading and you know it was just awful and um she acted like she didn't believe me and smacked me uh across the face but her slaps were actually hits they were full force you know knock you on your ass hits and this particular one propelled me forward so um my chin landed on a corner of a coffee table in our living room and it split open Um, my mom, I, you know, when I stumbled to stand up, my mom was in, you know, my stepdad's arms crying and wailing about, um, you know, 
she thought that I was going to hate her when I grew up and stuff like that. Meanwhile, I'm standing there by myself trying to gain my <laughs> composure and figure out what the hell just happened. Um, but yeah, and then we ended up going to, you know, the ER because I needed stitches and they told me a story they wanted me to tell the um, nurses and doctors and any other staff. Uh, and they, you know, brought up stories um, from after school specials that I don't know anybody who's old enough or if they remember those from the 80s um, after school specials that would um, they would depict foster parents as abusive and stuff. So uh, my mom and my stepdad were kind of trying to use that to scare me into thinking that if I was taken away from them, that's what would happen. And they did say to me that what they did was wrong. So I felt bad for them. Uh, You know, I totally fell for the like, oh, well, this is they're apologizing to me. That's how I saw it. At the hospital, I was sewn up and my parents were standing right outside of the door of the room uh, when the doctor asked me and there was a nurse there too, what really happened. Like they knew that the story was bunk. And the story was that I was riding my bicycle around the neighborhood and somehow lost control of my bike and my chin hit the corner of a mailbox. Um, They knew that that didn't happen. Uh, So they tried to get me to tell them the truth, telling me it was safe. But I could see my parents right outside the door. And so I was terrified. So I just stuck with the story. So that is a situation, and there were many of those throughout my life, that now as an adult, I find myself reading into things with people because of that damned if I do, damned if I don't feeling. Um, So yeah, like I'll have maybe times at work or something when I work for a law firm, um, if a partner just emails me and they're not like, you know, putting exclamation points with smiley faces in their email when they ask me for a report, I'll read it, you know, like, like I did something, like they think I did something wrong because they can't find this report. That's how I'll read the email. Um, so then I'll kind of send a reply email back, like being a little snippy, you know, well, I did do that report on such and such a day, you know, it's in this folder. Sorry that you can't find it, you know, that type of a thing. And then they'll reply back. Well, I wasn't accusing you of not doing it. I just needed help finding it. So that's kind of the situations that I find myself having to work through now is to try to be mindful before I let myself tell myself the story. Yeah, go. No one can can see what you just did, but... You did the uh, circling motion <laughs> as the hamster is going wild in your yes. brain over and over and over and poof. Yes, absolutely. It's gone. Yep. 20, 22 was now. here. Yep. But not, but not anymore. <laughs> exactly. You know, and triggers become a big thing for a lot of people. And, you know, for you, triggers throughout your life were created uh that makes being an adult very difficult um you know and it's one thing with this show where uh, i do my best to curate if that's possible uh so no one gets triggered and it is not easy to do and for you I guess what were, I guess, the biggest triggers that were created when you were younger? Like, where did they form and why? And how do you deal with those today? Um, Well, the first one that, you know, you and I discussed because you brought up Renee Brown once is uh, Preacher Cadence. (laughs) (laughs) So for people that don't understand, (laughs) I brought up something. I forget what I brought up about Renee Brown. And you were like, I'm going to imitate your voice. I'm going to do an imitation of your imitation of yourself <laughs> when you're trying to, if that makes sense. Okay. So I went Brene Brown and you went Tara Branch. Yeah. <laughs> and I go Brene Brown and you're like, Tara Branch. I don't <laughs> like Brene Brown. 
And I'm like, okay, <laughs> whatever. And then you explain, how was my imitation of you? <laughs> that was great. I like it. it that, that, <laughs> Spot on. Thank you. I have no <laughs> idea how that would sound, but um, that that was what you 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 were you were really anti Brene Brown. So explain how Brene Brown triggers you, and and okay. where that came from. Uh, yeah. So first of all. Since we've discussed that, I have listened to her podcast, and she does not have that cadence in the podcast episodes at all. It's a so t- it's a it's a TED Talk cadence. Yep, it was a one time experience that um, I shut her down just because of this one time. Somebody had I can't even remember what the topic of it was, but I mean it, the content was actually wonderful. But somebody had recommended a podcast up or a TED Talk episode, I'm sorry, that, you know, uh, was Brene Brown presenting. And in this particular TED Talk, she had that preacher cadence, you know, and I just could picture her. I remember I was walking on my lunch break downtown, you know, at work, and I'm listening to it with my headphones on, and I could just picture her, you know, pacing back and forth on the stage with her hands you know, folded just like the preachers did. And um, I listened to probably about half of it. And it really bothered me because I like, was torn between the fact that what she was saying was amazing, but I just couldn't. It was like grinding, like, chalk, you know, fingernails on chalkboard to me. Um, the sound of her voice was awful. And like her sound, the sound of her voice is fine. Now I know from listening to her actual podcast. But in this TED Talk scenario, for me, it was really hard to like hear the preacher cadence. So. And the preacher cadence to you represents what? Um, people being full of shit. But I also am married to somebody who grew up in a family of preachers. Um, not his immediate family, but his uncle's were either evangelists or pastors of churches. And um, I like had to endure some of their presentations. And one of the uncles, the one who was an evangelist, he went around touring the country, preaching against rock music, and would pick apart uh, rock songs, trying to prove that they were like demonic or they were going to make, kids do bad things and it was all just bullshit um and then you know like he and the other uncle they would just make up wild stories like bibles raising on their own you know from pulpits and all these things and you know my husband had firsthand knowledge that those things didn't happen because he grew up with them so he knew that they didn't occur so to me, that is what I equate that style of speaking with is bullshit. So if I hear somebody else using it, I automatically shut them down. I'm just like, I don't want to hear you. You're full of shit. Bye. Did, you, did your mom have this kind of cadence at all or no? She tried. Um, she like, if, if I were to be able to get her to speak to you, you would see that she tries to preach to everybody. That's also, you know, it's part of her grandiosity. Um, but yes, yeah, she tries, but she she doesn't have it. But yeah. But the mere fact that she is trying to present herself in this manner uh, is um, triggering for you because you know what her intent is. Yes. And it's always they're full of shit. You know, like, uh, I, you know, my mom lied about most things, possibly everything. I don't know. So it's just, yes, exactly. Anybody who (laughs) presents it, if they have that cadence, it's, I really, and you know, that's something that I'm planning on working through now is, okay, that's, that's just a public speaking style. That doesn't mean that everybody who uses it has misinformation Mm. 
And what other triggers uh, that did your mom create that uh, are now currently working against you? Anything, if I do feel like my individuality is being threatened, um, I have issues with that. So, you you know, in a joking manner, you brought the anagram up. And uh, I can't stand personality tests. And, like, you know, most corporations at some point or another – They'll get all excited <laughs> about the newest personality test that's popular. And then, you know, they'll have everybody take it thinking it's going to, you know, change the world, I guess, <laughs> make their company a bunch of money. But, um, yeah, so I, personality tests are a trigger for me. I don't like them because, first of all, I feel that from day to day, I might answer some questions differently. Um, so I feel like, although they are quite accurate, I don't think, you know, they're a hundred percent accurate. Um, and that kind of bothers me a little bit, but go ahead. I can tell that you want to. Oh, no. I mean, anything to do with a, uh, what you perceive to be an attack on your individuality. Yeah is because you were not allowed to be uh, your own person. You were, I don't even know if you're an extension of your mom. You're more of uh, an audience or, uh, you know, an audience or a competitor of your mom that you were raged at, Um, you know, because an extension would be that, you know, she would want you to do certain things that she says you should do, but also maybe have, be prideful of the things that you did accomplish. And your mom didn't have that type of uh, attitude. She wasn't um, prideful of your accomplishments. If that is that correct? She wasn't, but she was uh, like uh, with my appearance. That was where the extension of my mom came in. Okay. So especially after she started aging herself a little bit, where, I mean, it was like it very, it was a little bit odd with my mom, but she was so like beautiful. And then it was just like she had a wall where she just stopped trying. And I it, like more so than the normal person does with aging. Like a lot of people stop trying because they're just too tired to make the effort anymore. And that's normal. I'm talking about like, like bad, like not taking care of herself at all. Like now she's like a psycho clown. So, (laughs) so what, so once that, so once that happened, which obviously was a little bit later on in, in your life, she then started to ask you, or to be like more makeup, more this, more that, look this way. Um, she wouldn't ask me to, but I was I was a teenager by then, so I already was, you know, experimenting with, you know, like wearing makeup and and you know, cute clothes or whatever, uh, trying to get attention from boys and stuff like that. So, but that is the one thing that I would get positive reinforcement for her on course unless that had to do with me being an individual <laughs> then then it would go south but um yeah and then especially after i moved out then like if i saw them at holidays you know my mom would just be like, oh you're so beautiful blah 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 but i think it it was because then for whatever reason that she didn't think she was looking good anymore then she could use me as we'll see how beautiful my daughter is, that type of thing. Um, so that, like, for years, you know, uh, pr- kind of gave me this um, drive to look really good. So I spent a lot of time on my appearance. So another trigger you had growing up, which still goes on today, goes back to that family that lived across the street from you. And here's a family that is from another country and, you know, they don't have a lot of power in society 
at, at that time, people can be racist against them. Your family was uh, as well. So, you know, framing that in the sense of standing up or getting angry when uh, people uh, take advantage of maybe the power that they have or, or put other people uh, below them. Can you talk about how that manifests with you right now? Yeah, I mean, it, it does for me as well. Um, but I, I feel that like the response will be stronger if I see somebody else either being condescended to or else their power being trying to take away. If, if I, if I recognize it. And this response will be stronger for other people, I assume, because you still have a problem standing up and voicing something for you. Or, like, I'll definitely have, like, a little bit of the, well, I can take care of myself <laughs> type of attitude. But, but yes, there is, there, it is hard for me to stand up for myself. Um, that probably does have a lot to do with it, is that, like, I don't feel like, you know, I have a right to stand up for myself because that's how I was raised, to believe. Um, yeah. But I was also put in the position of surrogate mother. So I have a protector spirit, you know, and uh, I will fuck somebody up if they're trying to hurt somebody else, basically. So with how you grew up, we've heard a lot of things that happened within your life. You know, a, a lot of stories today, all the issues you're dealing with. And, you know, uh, we're, I guess we're now at a point where a big thing would be your healing process because you have gone no contact with your family. Yes. You don't speak to them anymore, as far as I know. And now you're going through this healing process. Uh, a big thing for you is self-forgiveness uh, and, I guess, taking your power back. Yes. If, if those are the big things. So walk us through you know, what self-forgiveness is to you, how you're doing it, and how you are taking your power power back in some ways okay so um the self-forgiveness that the reason why i really wanted to speak about that is because for me that was a part that i couldn't go but i wasn't allowing myself to grieve and continue with the grieving process once i realized that what happened to me was wrong on like because i was still stuck in that self-blame cycle that I was taught in my life. Basically, how I started is I worked with a therapist, and then I found your podcast, and I was listening to episode after episode, especially family stories of the podcast, and the algorithms (laughs) of Spotify brought Tara Brock up. Um, and so I started listening to her. Explain uh, who Tara Brock is or explain who Tara Brock is. <laughs> so Tara Brock is, um, she's a psychologist, uh, but she, she does like, I think conferences and, um, retreats and stuff that are like healing trauma, healing, you know, retreats. She does a lot of stuff. But and, she, that's and she's fun. now part, because of you, she's now part of our meditation nights. Yes. She exactly. does our meditations. She doesn't know that, but she, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but she does. Um, so, yeah, she has wonderful guided meditations, um, which was important to me at the time, because even though I do silent seat of meditation when I was going through, like, the crisis, or you guys call it the dark night of the soul, Um, part of the healing process, my mind was just too busy with, you know, trauma basically to just sit. So the guided meditations helped, but um, yeah, so she does a lot of self-forgiveness talks uh, where she is trying to teach the listener to embrace their evil twin, so to speak, or I guess, you know, your shadow self, if you're going to use Jungian terms. Um, But because of that, because of listening to her, then I came across this poem. And that, like, once I read it, I just, something in my brain snapped. And I was like, I get it. I get it now that in order to 
be putting good out into the world, I have to forgive myself. I have to show myself compassion first. So if I don't love myself, I'm going to be unhappy and I'm going to be stuck in that shame cycle, lashing out. But if I'm happy with myself and I love myself, then I'm able to walk out with a healthy mind into the world and put goodness out. That's how I explain <laughs> this whole mentality in my simple words. But um, So you're going to read it? I, if that's okay, I'd like to. So here's a poem that you're going to read by Tick Not Hun. Did I say it correctly? Yes, we did. And it's called Please Call Me By My True Names. Don't say that I will depart tomorrow. Even to, I'm already crying. Even today I am still arriving. Look deeply. Every second I am arriving to be a bud on a spring branch. To be a tiny bird with still fragile wings learning to sing in my new nest. To be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower. To be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond, and I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks, and I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate, and I am the pirate. My heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people, dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and my laughter at once. So I can see that my joy and my pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up. So the door of my heart can be left open. The door of compassion. That was rough. <laughs> Sorry. So what, what is it about this specific poem that, you know, touches such a, such a chord with you? Um, so, like... I am all of my experiences. Like I'm the sum of all of the parts that made me. And I have to show myself compassion for the fact that I went through some things that may cause me to do bad things every once in a while. I'm going to fuck up basically. Um, I'm going to stumble, but the way I see it is like, I'm always going to be a toddler stumbling around trying to walk straight um and sometimes i'm going to fall down and i'm going to make a mistake and sometimes i'm going to walk across the room and make everybody proud (laughs) you know like uh and i'm going to do it fine um but i think that's really important for everybody to learn um that it's okay if you screw up you know it's okay if you find yourself accidentally or not accidentally, but if you, even if you hurt somebody, as long as you go back and work on it and figure out why you did that. And part of all of that is how we ended up here today. You've gotten stronger voicing your opinion. You're getting better at not insinuating or at least You know, if you are insinuating, kind of taking your time to understand what's real and and what's not real, you're taking your power back in the sense of your writing and you began writing again. Yes. And which is a big thing for you. And it it makes you feel strong if I'm I'm insinuating here or assuming. (laughs) Um, 
And, you know, today you told your story. You told your story a second time, but we did it completely different today. It feels different. Mm-hmm. You know, you're different today than the, the last time. Your whole body language is completely different. And I'm proud of you for for doing this today uh, mm-hmm. in the sense of, you know, understanding or not kicking yourself too hard about whatever happened before being open minded to cuz for a little bit you were like we don't have to do it again like you were kind of in that kind of mode and i'm like no 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 like and just being open to doing this and you know part of the healing process for you but it is to do this which isn't the point of doing this episode because you know the point of doing this for is for other people but Mm -hmm. for me you doing this for other people is to show your process and that your story is terrible what happened to you but the most amazing part is your resilience and going through things and you're 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 running through things and I mean, you're like a bulldozer of going <laughs> through things and it's something to be really proud of. Obviously you're going to need breaks here and there to rest because <laughs> it has to be exhausting. Um, but I mean, you've been, uh, in a way you're used to being exhausted cause you're, you're always dealing with things. So it's really a pleasure, um, to be here with you to do this and it was exciting for me to come and do this and, and be part of this and be part of your healing process to be here. And I hope a lot of people uh, learn a lot from how you're doing things because it's really healthy how you're doing it. And it, you know, it, it has to be freeing. I would, if you could explain your feelings like how it does feel or is that even, that's just a bad question. How do you, like, how do you explain Uh your feelings? That is not a bad feeling, or (laughs) that's not a bad feeling. That's not a bad question at all. Um, The only way I can describe it is that the way I feel now is, as I feel free and like, like I have had chains, you know, lifted off of me and, I was so uptight and wound up before, um, you know, like in self-hatred and all this stuff. And now it's just like, I, I just, I walk free. I don't, I really don't know how to explain it other than I get up and I wear what I feel like wearing every day without questioning myself. I write what I want to write, you know, I, say what I want to say to a degree <laughs> without being a dumbass, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, I feel free and weightless. And if you had any words of wisdom or advice for uh, everyone listening, what would it be? Uh, my big thing, and I will preach to the end about this one is that you have the power in yourself all of it like you have the power to get through processing the trauma you have the power to do whatever it is that you find you love you have it you don't need anybody else to lay a path out before you um by saying that (laughs) i want to clarify that i'm not saying don't have a therapist because that is if you can have one that is extremely helpful Um, and processing and also the support group is a big deal that is probably even huger than anything I think Um, but yes definitely just know that you have the power you do not need externals in order to get through well 22 we're done you did it yay it's over. You did, you did a, a fantastic job. I'm so proud of you. I know everyone in the group 
is going to cheer you on and is really proud of you too. So from them, from everyone who's listening, we're all giving you a big hug and a big thank you for, for being you, being the individual that is you and inspiring others to, to be that too. And, um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do this. And, you know, sometimes I, uh, well, the way we're doing things now, we, we now just kind of go into the end of the show, which used to be at the beginning of the show. So you'll stick around while, while I do it. So everyone, if you want to be a guest on the show, just like 22 here, you can go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Is that where you went? That is where I went. Oh, and fantastic. <laughs> and then you went to the top of the page and you press that guest form button. And when you press that, there was a guest form or an email address, both, and all these instructions. You followed them. You sent that stuff to me and you did a great job by sending it to me. You did. It was beautiful looking. <laughs> I sure did. <laughs> and you sure did. And, you know, so if you want to be guest on our show, do that. Go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. But also at NarcissistApocalypse.com, we have our very own support group, which 22 is in. In the top of the page, there's a button that says support group. You press that button, then you probably press another thing, and away you'll go. We have forum boards, and guess who's our number one poster? (laughs) Who? Who is it? 22. 22. (laughs) We have... (laughs) We have... Zoom meetings, Wednesdays and Saturday nights. I think in the new year, we're going to start one in the afternoon. I'm not sure what day of the week that's going to be, but we will. And we have episodes that never made it to air. I have so many I have to post. I was going through my memory card today and uh, there's like 20. Um, And uh, we also have uh, ad-free episodes. If you just want to support the show... And, you know, help us out a little. Also, just join the group. It helps us out a lot. We also have meditation nights with whose favorite person? What's your favorite person? Tara Brock. Tara Brock. (laughs) Was I saying Tara Bratch earlier? No, you you actually only when you were making fun of. Oh, when I was making fun of you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So... (laughs) So we have meditation nights, everyone. We have uh, closure ceremony. So join our group at NarcissistApocalypse.com. And at the top of the page, there's a support button. If you need more support than what we offer you, please do go to DomesticShelters.org. DomesticShelters.org has tons of stuff there. They have free resources there. They can help you get a hold of a shelter if you need that. They can help you with a lot of things. They can help you get in touch with possibly uh, free uh, law help and, and things along those, maybe, maybe free therapy. They have a lot of stuff and resources there, great articles for you to learn from. So please do go to DomesticShelters.org as well. And uh, what else? Am, what else am I missing here? Have, have we uh, covered everything here today? I think so. Do I? What do I normally cover? I usually go. This is the end of the year. This will be coming out probably around Christmas time. So, happy holidays to people. I know some people uh, don't get together with family anymore, and it's a and it's a sad time of the year. So, if that's you, we're giving you a big hug from myself in twenty two. And now I think that is it. So from twenty two and I, say bye. Goodbye. Love you. We hope you have a good night.